We're ready. Good morning, everybody. I'm Froy Ascano. I'm the NSL Research and Evidence-Based Practice House White Chair, and I'll be your host for this morning. Um, welcome to the fourth annual and the biggest nursing research symposium we've ever had. Today is an opportunity for the nurse researchers to share their important findings and to encourage collaboration and information sharing within our profession. At the end of the symposium, um, please um, stay and join us for some refreshments, and um, we also have poster sessions on the right side. Uh, some housekeeping issues is um, please no drinks and no food in the auditorium and um, please turn off your cell phones as well. Uh, also, we also have evaluation forms for podium presenters and podium presenters that nurse, uh, LPCH nurses that may fill out um, at least three podium presenter evaluation or five poster presentation evaluation and you will be qualified to win a trip for this year's Magnet Conference this October at Orlando, Florida. So, um, yeah, so. Uh, so I'm pleased to see you all today. Um, before we proceed, I would like to thank Lucille Packard Children's Hospital's nurse scientist for dedicating all her efforts to make this symposium possible. Thank you, Dr. Annette Nasser. Thank you. And, before we proceed, we, um, I would like to introduce our um, Chief Nurf Nursing Officer, Susan Costello, to say a few words. Good morning, everybody. It is fantastic to see such a good turnout. I am so impressed. I've been touring the posters. They are fantastic. You guys are just doing a wonderful job helping us create evidence-based practice and an understanding about why we do the interventions that we do. I am so thrilled to be here with you. Um, research is, you know, so I've been a doctorally prepared nurse for about half of my life. It's a really scary thought, don't you think? <laughs> I must be 112. Actually, unusually, I started young on that journey. Um, but it's a, been a passion of mine to understand why we do the things that we do and not do them just because it's our way. And I am truly thrilled to be at a place where you share that passion for understanding the reasons why we do them. As a consultant, I used to describe myself as the world's worst orientee because <laughs> I think those folks are the primary source of PICO questions because they ask us, why do you do it that way? At my old shop, we, and then they describe the alternative process. And we go, hmm, this is Lucille Packard way, come on now, just play with us, which is not ever the right answer, right? The right answer is here is the science behind what we do. And we always need to be able to find those answers within ourselves. And if we can't, we need to examine how they did it at that other hospital and see if it's not a better approach than the one we are currently using. Because being open to new information is the primary characteristic of a good scientist, someone who will always question their reality. You know, there are very few laws of nature, taxes and death. Those are our two definites. Some people even figure out how to get out of taxes. But I am so looking forward to spending the day with you and um, listening to some of the presentations this afternoon. I will, unfortunately, because I am that CNO person, be in and out, but mostly in. Um, so I look forward to chatting with you, and if I haven't had time to stop by your poster, plan on explaining it to me. Thank you.
So our first speaker um, is Dr. David Vlauf. Dr. Vlauf is the Dean and Professor at University of California, San Francisco School of Nursing. He brings experience in interprofessional and interdisciplinary education and research, serving on the faculty as Professor of Epidemiology at Johns Hopkins and Columbia Universities, with adjuncts in medical schools at Cornell, Mount Sinai, and University, New York University, and the College of Nursing at New York University, he has also served as co-director at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Health and Society Scholars Program. He brings research exper expertise in epidemiology, infectious diseases, substance abuse, and mental health. Dr. Dr. Vlahov conducted studies of urban populations in the Baltimore for over 20 years and has led epidemiologic studies in Harlem and the Bronx, which have contributed much information on racial, ethnic disparities in health and approaches to address such disparities. Dr. Vlahov initiated the International Society for Ur Urban Health, serving as its first president and also served on the New York City Board of Health. Dr. Vlahov is the editor-in-chief of Journal of Urban Health has edited three books on urban health and published over 610 scholarly papers. Wow. <laughs> in 2011, Dr. Vlahov was both elected to the Institute of Medicine and inducted as a fellow of American Academy of Nursing. In 2012, he, has invited by, he was invited by the National Department of Health and Human Services to serve on the National Advisory Council on Nurse Education and Practice. In early 2013, he was elected to the Board of Directors of the American Association of Colleges of Nursing. Um, let us all welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. David Vlahov. After that introduction, I can't wait to hear what I have to say. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the school. I'm going to tell you a little bit about a future vision of health care that I think uh, nursing is at the center of. And then I'm going to talk a little bit here about the patient experience and patient engagement. And that shapes the clinical experience overall. So what you heard about me in that brief uh, uh, introduction uh, let, let me fill that in a little bit, and that is, I started as a nurse, and I was in Baltimore at the University of Maryland. So I graduated from there and went into working in intensive care, medical, surgical, adult. And I would go to the pediatric ward, and I had so much respect for the nurses that work there. That was just a, a tremendous amount of sensitivity, expertise, not only in working with the children, but also in working with the parents and other family members. So that to me was holistic in every sense of the word. And that's a respect that I've carried with me throughout. Now as my career went on, I uh, worked as a chief uh, nurse for a maximum security prison hospital. And uh, I have to say that was the quietest two years of my life, right? Um, and, and maybe at lunch or out in the hall we can talk about that a little bit more. But that's all about how you organize care. And in terms of being able to communicate with patients, uh, to communicate with other staff, to create a sense of a safe environment where people can come get care uh, there was never an incident that occurred during the time that I was in there. Now, there were times where I worked days. Back then, there were evenings and nights. And finally, there was a position that came up in hospital epidemiology. Now, I didn't know what epidemiology was, but I knew it was 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. <laughs> so I applied for the position and got it. And what it was was looking at uh, infections in hospitals. That's really where it started. And you know, you do surveillance, you give feedback to uh, the staff on each of the wards and the hospitals overall. And every now and then there would be an, an outbreak, right? And we would find a cluster of cases. And that to me was just fascinating to try to figure out why that was happening. 
Why was that happening? And first of all, you have to figure out what are the cases, where are they, what's the time, the place, the persons that are involved. You have those that are ill and those that are not from those infectious diseases in the hospital. And from that, it was very logical about how you could narrow down what might be happening. And there were a number of these, and from one perspective, it was intellectually very rigorous. The other part of it was people on the wards were afraid, right? You know, what was happening? Was it something that I did? And so you came in, and you were seen as the expert. And uh, one of the things that I learned in the job is that every now and then somebody would call you and ask you about something and you had no idea what it was. So you would say, can I put you on hold real quick? And there would be a Bible where you'd click, look it up. And then, you know, you had to speak with confidence. But as time went on, you start to get a little bit more expertise in what you're doing. Well, there was one outbreak that I got to where with the infectious disease physicians, others, we couldn't figure out what had happened. Couldn't figure it out. We tried everything. We swabbed people and all these other things that we did. And finally, just had to put it, it stopped by itself, and we put the data in a drawer. So it was about, I guess, uh, six, seven months after that, there was a medical student that came to our office and asked for uh, an elective during the summer to do hospital epidemiology and really had a great time with this student. It was just uh, showed him surveillance, showed him a little bit about what we were doing. And then I pulled these data out of a drawer, and I said, here's an epidemic uh, outbreak that occurred that we couldn't figure out. And he said, oh, well, we can do a case control study on this, and let's see if we can tease it apart. And I said, well, what are you talking about? He said, well, let's take the cases and those that are not cases, let's pick those out a little bit more carefully, and then let's go down to the record room and figure out what they had, what they took, and was that going to be more common, what was more common in those that, uh, you know, were the cases in that case. And uh, so we did that, and it was uh, a lot of work. You know, you order a lot of charts back then, and they were written charts, and you had to wait for them and so forth. It's a lot easier now, isn't it, with the electronic medical records. So we got all the cases and we figured it out and we found, oh my gosh, you know, here it is, it's an unusual finding. We went to the literature, right, to the evidence base, and nobody had written this up, right? Nobody had found this before. So what we did is we wrote it up and we published three papers in one summer. And it was so cool. And the response in the literature was uh, very positive. And I said, this is great. This is great. This is what research is. So the medical student said, well, you're here in Baltimore. Why don't you go over to Johns Hopkins and get a PhD in epidemiology? <laughs> and uh, I said, oh, well, no, I, I, you know, I don't know. You know, they won't accept me. And, <laughs> you know, and so forth. And he said, uh, oh, don't worry about it. My dad's the chairman of epidemiology, <laughs> right? So I thought, you know, bolstered a little bit. So uh, I put in my application, and I sent it in. And, uh, you know, I waited the time that you have to wait for something like this. And I got a letter in the mail. It was a thin envelope. You know, that's not usually a very good sign. And uh, so I opened it up, and I was rejected. And I thought, oh, man, talk about a blow, right? So I wrote a letter back, and I said, you know, I've been working in this area. It took me, you know, a lot of, I'm, you know, just passionate about this. And I'm just really disappointed. This is something I really want to do. And I can't believe, you know, and so forth and so on. So I sent it in, and I got it off my chest, and I figured, you know, I'll, I'll do something else. And uh, about two weeks later, I got a letter. This time it was a thick envelope. And uh, I had been accepted, and they gave me a scholarship. So, yeah, yeah. And so here I stand in front of you today. Um, I guess there are a few lessons there. And one is, is seeing the power and value 
of being able to investigate what it is that's about you. You know, there's some parts where you can go to the literature and you can say, you know, gee, how have other people done it? But there are also times where you get the opportunity to look at what's in front of you and to create that new knowledge. And there's going to be some surprises that are in there. There are a number of times since then where I've done studies and we found something that was different than everybody else had in the literature. And what happens in that kind of circumstance? Well, first you question your methods. Maybe, you know, I didn't write the right, you know, or skip something or, you know, whatever. So you go back over your methods over and over and over again. And then you might even repeat it. And you might even ask somebody else if they're seeing the same thing you are. But if you do, and you still come out with that result, that's an important piece of information. And that's important to get out there in posters, at scientific meetings, let other people see it. Because they'll ask you questions, right? You'll have discussion. And you might find that somebody else may go to their institution and try it out the way you looked at it. And as time goes on, you may find that you actually have made a discovery. And when you make that discovery, there's nothing like it. It's just something that you realize that your thinking, your observations have moved the field forward, right? So again, it's that being curious and looking at what is it that's going on in front of you. Why is it the way it is, right? And what is it about what you're doing that has one kind of outcome versus another. There are different ways that you can do this. One is, is that you may look at a ward or you may look at a series of patients that have a similar uh, kind of condition that brought them into the hospital. And you say, on one of the, you know, one group of them, they seem to have better outcomes than the others, right? They're in for the same thing but one group of people seems to have better outcomes than the others. What makes it different? How do you start to tease that apart? And again, it's having conversations, making those observations, generating the questions. And that's the start of where it is that you go. So that, for me, is a very exciting way uh, to get yourself in terms of thinking how you can advance practice. Within your hospital, across different hospitals. You're going to have the magnet hospital meeting. Who's going to win that one? Who can tell, right? But you get to go to the meeting and you find out what other people are doing. And you say, hmm, is that something we can bring back here? What are the kinds of questions that you're asking them? So again, the idea of having those questions, trying to collect some of the data, uh, you have an expert uh, consultant here and Dr. Annette Nasser, and uh, certainly the uh, director of nursing here, who spent half her career in, uh, as, a, as a doctorally prepared nurse. There's a lot of expertise. And we at the uh, University of California, San Francisco, do a lot of research. And we're very excited to be able to work with partners, to be able to come in, to sit down and say, how is it that we can look at this together? So that's a partnership that I'm here to hopefully build stronger. It's been there, but let's see if we can build it stronger. All right? So the University of California, San Francisco School of Nursing, there are a number of you that uh, have gone to school there. How many in this room? Oh, my gosh. So this is, uh, y you, can, uh, you can tell me if I'm accurate. When I, when I talk about it. It's uh, one of the oldest schools of nursing west of the Mississippi, and it was one of the first ones in the country and, and the first west of the Mississippi to have a doctoral program in nursing. And that doctoral program has gone on to become the number one program in the country, and that's not U.S. News and World Report, right? That's a popularity contest, right? That's Deans vote for each other, and they, you know, smoke-filled rooms, and, you know, a lot of horse trading going on. So everybody thinks it stinks unless you're number one, right? So, but 
for the doctoral program, it's the National Research Council of the National Academy of Sciences. And they go out and they create a survey to be able to do all doctoral programs. And then they provide the rankings. And so you can go online. Uh, we're by far number one in the rankings. And unlike some other ranking systems where it's just you get a number of who's there, here you're able to move around. What is it that you want? What's most important for you in getting a uh, doctoral degree? So there's uh, tables and they all kind of move around. That's kind of neat in terms of figuring out what you want. The master's programs, there are a number of them that are very highly rated, right? So the uh, family care nurse practitioner program, top in the country. And there's the pediatric component of that. I believe Linda Frank came down here. She's chair of the uh, department, and she's come down here to give a talk to you all. So there's a really superb faculty, and they provide clinical training and certainly clinical partnerships. And I know a number of you that have graduated from the program have become uh, the most important asset that a school like that can have which is excellence and preceptorship for the new students that come across. So I really want to thank you uh, for those of you that have been serving as preceptors for the next generation of students that are coming through. We have about 560 students at this point. Most of them are masters, uh, uh, about 420, and we have about 100 that are doctoral students. There's a program that we have called MEPIN, Master's Entry Program in Nursing. And what that is, is you have somebody that's got a bachelor's degree in one thing, art, architecture. We can go all the way through to zoology. And they've decided that nursing's kind of a cool career to uh, pursue. So they take their science courses if they haven't had them. And then they come in and do a pre-licensure year and they're automatically at the application admitted into the master's program so that they can become a nurse practitioner or a clinical specialist. And some of them have a step out year that's required and for some of them it's uh, passed straight through. And what we found is that those are absolutely fantastic people because they've matured a little bit in terms of what they want but they also bring uh, perspectives that get shared with the class, and some of them have gone on uh, to become prominent leaders in the field of nursing. This was one of the first programs in the country. They've sprouted up in other places. So I think that's something that we're going to be seeing in nursing. So I've talked about the masters. I've talked about uh, the PhD. I've talked about the MEPIN. And some people have been asking me about the doctor of nursing practice the DNP, right? And those have been springing up around the country. There are 188 programs now in the country. If you went back seven years ago, it was just a small handful. But now it's really become widespread. And so I think it's not just a fad. I think that's where the field is moving. And the idea for us at UCSF is to look at this saying, is this an area where we should move? Seven years ago, the idea was, nope, we're going to concentrate on PhDs. But because the field is moving, we're looking at developing, and there's a proposal that's been developed that the faculty will vote on in May to be able to offer a DNP. So that'll be a postmaster's uh, program as that comes through. So you get the two years of the master's, and then a year and a half for the, uh, uh, to get the DNP. So that's a little bit about what we've got going. We're um, a heavily research intensive school, right? We've been either one or two in NIH funding, and there's funding from many other sources. And the research has uh, really gone across the gamut. And so in the next phase, what I'm going to be doing is talking about what some of the future is that I see for nursing and nursing research. Ends part one, I take a sip of water and then we... Thanks.
I feel like Mark Rubio here. <laughs> what are the trends going forward in nursing? Right? There are a lot of things that have been happening in the last five years. Right? Institute of Medicine report on the future of nursing. Number of recommendations that have come out of that in terms of most of the nurses now should be baccalaureate at entry. We should double the number of doctorally prepared nurses. Nurses should be able to practice to the scope, um, to the level of their education. And like all IOM reports and researchers, more data is needed, right? So there is a lot more data that's going to be coming out. One of the important things that the uh, report also did was to review all the data that had been done on nurse practitioners and clinical specialists to deal with the issue of quality, safety, outcomes, satisfaction, right, patient satisfaction, and cost. Five areas. And it was all the studies were compared to physicians. And what it showed in those studies is that the early ones showed that nurse practitioners were as good as the physicians in primary care and in a number of specialties. But those were the earlier studies that used the physicians as the standard. And some of the later researchers said, well, wait a minute, maybe there's some standards that we should look at that the nurse practitioner does better at. And so those studies went over time, and again, a complete 28 uh, studies that were done. And what it did is it showed something that I don't think is altogether surprising, and that is that the physicians were a little bit better in terms of uh, identifying complex diseases, right? And the nurse practitioners were better in terms of communication which is part of our training. So then we start thinking it's not one uh, and the other coming together to be the same thing. There's a role differentiation that we can be talking about. Overlap, but each brings something special. That's been something that's been very important. And now with the Institute of Medicine having that as part of their report, it is a very valid source of information, right? IOM reports are like the good housekeeping seal of approval. So that's something that we have looking forward. Right now in the California Senate, there's Bill Senate Bill 491. How many of you know about this? I got one hand. I see two, three, four. The idea is that nurse practitioners can have independent practice. Right? And it went through the professions committee, it passed, and today it goes to the appropriations committee. And we'll see what happens. And there's a lot of action back and forth, and again, that's that back room and cigar smoke and so forth. And so there are going to be amendments attached and what's going to be happening. That's, that's a trend to watch. That's a trend to watch. And again, the idea is that you're looking at what is the role differentiation. And that's not just in primary care, but it's also thinking about what happens in an acute care setting, right? So what are some of the other trends that we're looking at? Well, I think of several, right? One is, is symptom management, and that's something that we've worked with at UCSF for about two decades. And that is, how is it that you assess and manage symptoms of patients in terms of being able to most successfully monitor what's going on? Pain is a big example, right? Right now, hospitals uh, have patient uh, surveys that are done, and one of the criteria is, you know, how well was pain managed? Well, that's something that's difficult to assess properly, and there are a lot of questions about how to manage it. And so that's an area where we've done quite a bit of research, but there's still more that we need to learn uh, in terms of sleep and sleep hygiene. Uh, and you have to think about young parents on that one. What are the different patterns that we need to look at? What are the strategies that we can have 
for patients and for families to be able to get the rest they need because the rest is so important for health outcomes. There are a number of other symptoms that we know about and that as nurses we work with patients in terms of managing it. It's not all pharmacologic. It's a number of different approaches. So at the bedside, in the clinics, working with the patients, that's a very important area for us to be able to look at. Another area here for the future is one that I see in place here uh, at Stanford and at Packard is the te technology interface, right? One of the things that we look at is the electronic medical record, right? Uh, I worked in the VA in 1983, and they were putting in an electronic medical record. And I just assumed over time that, you know, that would, everybody had it. Well, there are a number of hospitals that have just been slowly implementing that now, right? It's a lot of work. It's pretty expensive. You got to keep updating it, right? So that's where we're going, electronic medical records. And I took a, a, a look at the ones that you have here. And it's really kind of neat how you've all got something that hooks together well in terms of the different components and how you all talk to each other. But there's some research questions in there as well. And that is, what are the communication patterns that happen between clinicians, between different parts of the hospital? If something is written down, do you have the nuance of a conversation that happens during a, a pass-off, a handoff between people? What are the differences that can happen in communications that we should be highlighting? Another one is uh, what are the unintended consequences in terms of looking at electronic medical records? And one of the things that uh, people have talked about is if you have electronic medical records, well, that's going to save money for hospitals, right? Because, you know, the information flow and so forth that's going to happen. Turns out the cost of health care in some of these hospitals has gone up because people are doing more efficient billing for things that used to get lost, right? So, so much for the cost of health care. But there's also how are notes made? There was a report from some other hospital uh, in another area of the country where docs were cutting and pasting earlier notes, right? Because we got to get out of here and move on to the next thing. And they got into quite a bit of trouble about that. What are some of the unintended consequences of what it is that we do? We want to have the most excellent care Right? We want the best patient experience that you can have. And electronic medical records is something that we need to look at. Another area that we're looking at is alarm fatigue. Right? In intensive care units, number of places that you go into, it just is beeping and buzzing and so forth. So number of places people turn off. Right? And there are no sounds whatsoever. Other places, people just kind of tune them out. Well, the alarms are not really good for the patient. They're not really good for the families that are coming in there that are stressed out. And if people really aren't paying attention to them, then what is it that we're going to be doing? So what we have is some of our faculty are taking data from hundreds of thousands of patients and putting them through and doing big data analyses to see what is it, what are the patterns that are the most important, right? Maybe it isn't just this particular monitor for heart rate and another one for blood pressure and another one for EKG that independently may be beeping. It's what pattern together is it that you can hook to say, if you have this cluster, that's important. Not the independent ones, but what's the cluster of activities that you have. So that's a data analysis issue, and people are working on that right now. Another part is how do you display that information? And we've had some conversations with GE recently, 
and we've been talking about the data that are coming through and what are the clusters of, uh, of um, output from the various machines. And in GE, what they have is heads of sections, right? So there's GE Health, uh, GE Aviation, and so forth. And they require that the people that are the heads of those rotate, right? And that sounds like, gee, you know, I'm in healthcare. Now I got to go to aviation. I don't know anything <laughs> about aviation, right? But it turned around the other way, and that is the person from aviation sat down at a meeting we had at the school, and he was listening to it. And he said, you know, we had this kind of issue in aviation. And there was an Air France plane that it crashed, and one of the things was there was too much uh, beeping and buzzing and data for the pilots to be able to work with. So what they said is, when you're flying, you know, that, that's flying. You know, there, you, you know, you can call your family, whatever, it's kind of automatic pilot. But on takeoff and landing, those are particularly dangerous times. So no talking, right? Let's cut out all the sound. But what are the important elements to be looking at? And they saw that of, you know, if you've been in a cockpit, you know, it's nothing but, you know, dials and, you know, lit up buzzers and so forth. They have a heads up display that comes up and it has the three to six most important things to be able to look at that tell you something different is happening and you're going to have to do something different than what you're doing right now. So is this something that we can put into ICUs, into healthcare setting, to say, here's something that we need to be doing differently? Is that cool or what? Mm -hmm. Right? So that's one of the areas of research that we're trying to move forward with. Another one that we're working with is uh, people go home. And as they go home, one of the things that we're going to be talking about a little bit is you want to prevent the readmissions, right? So you have the continuity of care, and one of the things is you make sure there are good discharge instructions. You make sure that uh, there's some contact with the person once they're at home. You make sure a number of steps are taken care of. But one of the things that happens is you have rehabilitation, Right, And so the rehabilitation may be the person has to come back to the hospital to get it. right? And so that's an inconvenience of them coming back and forth, particularly if the person is from Southern California, from the mountain states, uh, flew in from Saudi Arabia or whatever. So how is it that you can deal with nursing care and other kinds of care at home? If we look at home visits, we're also talking about containing costs. One third of the home visit is somebody driving to the home and driving back. So there's inefficiency that's right there. There are a number of things that we've been working on, and one of them uh, you may have seen a little bit about is a gaming platform. And the gaming platform that we worked on, we, I'm saying in a royal we, this is uh, Glenna Dowling has been on the lead, is to say, here's a patient with Parkinson's, right? So an older patient in this case. And what she did was uh, with a company to develop a gaming platform where a person could do exercises, right? Just by following the images that were like a cross-country skiing. And the data from that were coming back to the, uh, uh, the nurses and then to be able to monitor it. It was also programmed if there was a weakness in a particular area that the program would adjust for that. So it was customizing the kind of service that the person was getting, right? So technological interface, there are a number of different ways that we can be looking at this, right? What else do we got? So we got tech interface, we've got, oh, Transitional care, just mentioned this a little bit. More and more, this has become important. And we're going to talk about this a little bit in terms of the patient experience and the patient engagement. But it's really the pass-off between units and the units to home. And again, as I was talking with uh, uh, some of the staff here, 
you've got this well taken care of, right? And there are refinements that we can have in terms of how is it that a person can learn enough, know enough, feel comfortable enough, and in communication to have that transitional care. So that's the area. Last one is public health and policy. And a lot of times we don't think about that in a hospital context, but there are many things that are going on in the policy arena. One of them, we talked about the Senate Bill 491, but we also have a number of things, and that is we are looking at what are the three biggest killers in the United States today? What are they? Heart disease? Cancer? What else? You're all wrong. Those are what you die of, right? But what are the killers? The killers are diet, exercise, and tobacco. Those are the three biggies. So what is it that we can do with the patients, with the patient's family, in terms of saying what are the health risks that are associated with these activities? Because these are the three biggest ones if you look at behaviors that we're going to be able to address to prevent chronic diseases in later life. How is it that you build that into the nursing care, even within the acute care setting where you're able to have that interaction with the parents, with the other family caregivers? Maybe that doesn't seem like that's a priority, but where are you able to bring that in for discussion, right? So those are three areas that we want to be able to look at. Now there's one-on-one -on -one kind of uh, teaching, right? Anti-smoking intervention is 12-session, one-hour, one-on-one kind of intervention. Now, what is it that you're competing against? You're competing against a social media market that is just blasting constantly, right? It could be sugary uh, cereals for kids, and here you are having a one-on-one -on -one with the family. So a lot of what we're doing in public health is to be able to say, how is it that you fight fire with fire in terms of bringing together not only the one-on-ones and the networks on networks, but to be able to look at us getting involved in the policy arena. So you say, how does that involve me? You know, here I am, I've got my day to day, but the other thing that you should always keep in the front of your mind is that you see what's in front of you. You know the experience of what's happened, right? So you have a voice of credibility that extends outside the walls of this institution and the role that you can have in terms of community activity is very important, right? So those are some of the areas that I see becoming more important as we're moving forward and affecting us in terms of the role of uh, nursing research and nursing practice. I'm going to take a break here because I'm getting a little dry. <laughs> Any questions or comments? Because that was a long introduction. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm kind of interested to hear a little bit more about you know, when you talk about um, these three behavioral centered things like diet and exercise and tobacco, these habits more or less that have been established um, well before they come here to the education setting. So, I mean, this is something that I kind of wonder like, we don't. When you talk about prioritizing, you know, care, when you have limited time and resources, and all the times our patients are not here for very long, we need to some discussion. But, um, so, if you're working with a patient and family that are, their typical diet involves a lot of fast food or high fat, and your priority is perhaps giving this child calories that they may need, or only focusing on the protein content for the association, but not really, I, I guess, like, how do you balance, like, not having
I think you raise a good point. You have a, a one issue that you bring up is priorities, right? You know, how can you talk about reducing calories when you need to increase calories? That's, I think, the example that you gave. So that's certainly one issue. The other is uh, how do you change behavior uh, in an individual or a group of people when you are um, uh, having so much else to do, right? So how do you fit that in with what you do? And that, I think, is uh, ripe for evidence-based uh, review. There are a number of things. There's some studies that came out just in the past couple of years that looked at the opportunity in a clinical setting where a parent uh, or parents bring their child in and they're concerned about what's going on. They're sensitized to what's happening uh, with them and what life is going to be like afterwards. And those may be critical moments in terms of a person listening and thinking about and having that teaching moment. And so you can stimulate a change. Obviously, it has to be reinforced as it's going out. But um, adding that to the kinds of conversations that are going on. Some elements may be overwhelming. And is this something that can be uh, more readily grasped? So again, there's an area here that needs a lot more attention and research to say, how is it that you might bring that in uh, to that environment? And it may be that it's not in one particular area, but do you build that in as part of the overall experience, which is before the person's admitted to already being out in the community? Is there a right time, place, considerations for something like that you know, to, to be considered? And that, that's, a, that's a very important thing. You're saying it looks like a collaboration opportunity. And as we're moving from siloed acute care hospitals, siloed community uh, resources to be able to create these accountable care organizations, uh, it's exactly that kind of continuum that I think increases uh, our opportunities for thinking about broader change. Yeah. Just to comment on this, just one topic in evidence-based practice and, and what we've experienced. One of the evidence-based practice projects that we experienced here at Packard about three years ago is um, Pat Cueto actually wanted to look at obesity and pediatrics and how nurses could better care for these patients. And she found in the literature there was very little about what we can actually do. But what we boiled her evidence-based practice, we changed her evidence-based practice project, and we realized that when kids are admitted to Packard, and we do weights on these kids. Um, BMI wasn't always calculated. This was right when we were starting with our medical uh, electronic medical record. And that we weren't even calculating BMI, so these kids who were admitted with asthma and were obese never even saw a dietitian or because we were just focused on the asthma. But then she implemented this way of calculating BMI on the electronic medical record so that when BMI was registering in the obese area, a dietitian would be notified and see the patient. And I don't really know what happens after that, whether there's a there's any communication with outside community, you know, when the kids discharge. But that those little things, just to be able to know that to even recognize and identify these kids as being obese and needing something is you know, just a underway to me to address the issue it's like it's very political and a lot of public policy because right now on Coca-Cola products, and I think like systemically, these, like, it's tr we need to get society to start looking at food and like what they put in their body as a wastebasket, or, you know, and so I think that one-on-one -on -one it's really hard to accomplish, absolutely, it needs to be like a real big systemic change. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, so there's some of the individual behavior change that you can go after, but you're also talking about you're, you're talking about what are some of the policy changes 
I was on the New York City uh, Board of Health when I was in New York at the time when they got rid of trans fats, banned the trans fats. That was one of the initiatives that we started. And the other one was the calorie labeling in uh, restaurants, right? And so that way the price, uh, the calories had to be at least the same size as the price, right? So you couldn't have it in small price. So, you know, in New York City, if you went to Krispy Kreme, the price was in like eight point print. So you couldn't see the calories, right? Yeah. So uh, what they found with that is um, that made some change for a period of time. A number of people, for example, the sales of French fries at McDonald's went down. Because you could have a hamburger, but boy, those French fries really knocked you up. Well, people would do that several times, and then they'd come back and say, well, you know, I like French fries. Right? So, again, that in and of itself, if you look at the experience with tobacco control, there it's been adding one more thing after another, and that's an environmental kind of uh, intervention. But that's something that we have to think about, how is it that what we do participates in that? Here's the opportunity, how do we identify and make the most of that opportunity? I see a head scratch. You know, if this were an auction, you would have bought that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was also thinking uh, of us as nurses and healthcare providers being the example that we present, and that's what I think the hospital is trying with doing all these health stuff, yeah. incentives to you know, be more healthy. Even though we know there's still a lot of people who are not really healthy or not to do exercise, so it's kind of understandable that, that you know, it's not that easy to solve right. this problem if we can't even do it ourselves. Right. So, I so guess being a role model for that. Yep. Yeah. Good thoughts. <laughs> All right, let's talk a little bit about the patient experience here. I'm going to walk you through, and this is, again, kind of a uh, sort of 10,000-foot view of some of what's been going on that I think has to shape our thinking. And, again, this poses environments, uh, uh, settings, uh, context for research questions. So if we look at patient experience, you know, what's the definition? And I'm not going to walk you through all 12 or 18 definitions that are out there, but I'm going to give you one that uh, uh, Kirsten Baird uh, put together, and that is the patient experience is the sum of all interactions shaped by an organization's culture. And we're going to come back to that, the organization's culture that influences patients' perceptions across a continuum of care. So each of these lines is important. When we talk about the sum of interactions, there are a lot of different interactions that occur in a healthcare setting. And if you look at the patients and talk with them, are they frustrated over the parking? Was there no uh, waiting for their appointment? That might be something that's positive. Did you get complete relief of symptoms? Uh, was there an abrupt, dismissive physician? Uh, sketchy discharge instructions? Prompt, reassuring phone call? So it can be positives, negatives, but it, it is the uh, perceptions. And perceptions is what's going to matter here. Perception for the patients is reality. There's nothing else, right? It's not what's actually happening. You had great intentions. You followed through with an activity, but it's the patient's perceptions that become very important. So we can uh, demonstrate clinical outcomes. We've got great uh, quality of care that's being delivered, but it's consumer-driven health care now that we're looking at, and the patient is in the driver's seat. So perceptions that are all that matters. It's what the patients remember and what will determine if they ever connect with your organization again. Continuum, what's that saying? There's a lot of writing down that's here, but what is it that you're saying along the continuum? It's beginning before admission 
and going all the way through afterwards, right? So you've got this period of time where the patient is with you, and there's something that's leading that patient into you, and that where that patient has to go afterwards. So you have to think about the patient, how are they uh, navigating through the system with piecemeal information about providers, resources, their symptoms, prompt and efficient, uh, excuse me, efficient access to services, how is that provided? Once the care is delivered, do patients leave with questions or possibly new symptoms? So again, patients are going to need guidance, navigation, reassurance throughout. So how do you measure the patient care experience? Well, there's the hospital consumer assessment of healthcare providers and systems. How many people are aware of this? Okay, we got two hands, I see four, four, okay. Uh, CMS put this in, it's the first national standardized publicly reported survey, and it's 27 items on this survey, and it's where uh, getting in touch with patients that have been discharged to talk about their hospital experience. Then the data from the hospitals is put up on a website, so you can look and go in and see what that's all about. Now, based on the answers to those questions, there is what's called value-based purchasing incentive payments. And that is, with the responses here, um, doing well acute care hospitals uh, for the quality of care uh, can get these incentive payments. It's going to be part of regular Medicare, uh, what they pay through the DRG system. So what's the driving force behind that patient experience? Um, again, there are two elements in this measurement of the value-based program, right? Clinical process of care, that's a lot of what we think about, but now we also think about patient experience of care. And 30% of the value-based is looking at the patient experience of care. What are the scores made up of? What are the elements that we have? Well, the experience of care domain is broken out into a number of different categories. Communication with nurses, communication about medicines, communications with doctors, pain management, cleanliness of the hospital environment, responsiveness of the hospital staff, discharge information, and the overall rating. Right? So there are a series of questions that go along with each of these. Have you seen these questions? Yeah? So those are the things that we're thinking about in terms of the patient experience and being responsive. So that's a little bit about patient experience. Now we talk about patient engagement. So patient experience, again, the RWJ looks at it as comprised of research reports and administrative information that reflect the quality from the perspective of patients by capturing observations and opinions about what happened during the process of healthcare delivery. All right? So again, it's looking at research reports and administrative information. Right? Some of that we think of the evidence base. There are a variety of indicators for patient-centered care, access, communication skills, customer service, helpfulness of office staff, information research resources. Patient engagement is really looking at the patient themselves. And it's a person's sustained participation in managing their health in a way that creates the necessary self-efficacy to achieve physical, mental, and social well-being. Right? So the experience is, what were my perceptions about a variety of different things that were happening as I was going through the institution? Right? And those are things that we can manipulate, we can uh, uh, work harder to do better. But we also have to look at the patient has to take some uh, part in what's happening with their health care. Experience versus engagement. Experience based on patient's perception of quality. Engagement based on patient's active and sustained participation in managing their health. Right? Two components that we have to look at here. 
patient experience is about perceptions, and engagement is about actions and behaviors. Patient can conceivably be satisfied with their healthcare experience while having minimal engagement. So how is patient engagement measured, right? Well, you talked about the patient experience as those 27 items. Did you have good communication with the nurse, with the doctor? Well, what is it that you have in terms of engagement? Well, interestingly, it's measured in uh, the electronic health record. And again, there was uh, looking at patient and family engagement, and the focus was on providers and hospitals on making information available to the patients timely and online. Now, having worked in Harlem for a number of years, the having information accessible online was a little problematic. There's a pro project now in Harlem called Wire Up Harlem, and again, 97% of residents in Harlem have access just in the past year. So again, probably a issue that's correcting. Presenting, visiting, and inpatient information in a manner that leads to the patient to view it, download, or transmit, right? So if you've got some something that looks like this slide, are you going to download it, or do you need colors and make it more attractive? Providing patient-specific education resources, how is it tailored to the individual, and are you promoting patient and provider interactions that uh, send secure messages to their provider? So here we've got something that's measurable, right? How are you engaging? Well, this one is, is how are we as providers engaging the patient? This is not the patient engaging themselves and others, uh, you know, the healthcare situation. And so here we're doing it through the electronic health record. I don't know about you, but to me that's not very satisfying. It's measurable, right? Everybody can have some sort of record of what's going on, but that's going to be limited. So what's the driving force behind doing patient engagement? Well, it goes back to the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, the Affordable Care Act as we know it. And again, Medicare, Medicaid payment adjustments, reductions, incentive payments, bonus, bundled, all of that's tied into this. And again, it's trying to shift away from fee-for-service to performance-based payments. Economics, right? Economics are driving this thing because we want to reduce health care costs. So delivery models have significant dependence on the active and sustained participation of patients after their hospital or provider visits in order to meet the financial targets. Now, what's that mean? What you're trying to do is a couple of things in the affordable care. One is to get a big health care system so you can get a lot of healthy people in there that you can then average the cost of those that need pre-existing illnesses uh, covered, right? So you've got that overall. But the other thing that you're trying to do is to prevent readmissions to the hospital, right? Because in this new system, you don't get reimbursed for those. You have to eat those costs. So that means thinking about the patient, not only their perceptions, but getting them engaged in the health care so that they take more responsibility for their own health care. And how is it that we can do that? So accountable care organizations, that's what this is talking about. It's a group of doctors, hospitals, other health care providers. Remember, we were talking about silos. Can we bring them together? And the goal of the coordinated care is to ensure patients, especially the chronically ill, get the right care at the right time while avoiding unnecessary duplication of services. When it succeeds in both delivering high-quality care and spending health care dollars more wisely, then you have a savings. And again, there's a sharing of the savings that happens back to the organization. So again, at the top, you're talking about sharing in the savings. So you want to have not only the savings, that's the economic side, right? But at the bottom, 
it's significantly dependent on patients actively participating in the management of their own health as a means of driving down the cost through reduced utilization of services, right? That's what this is all about. Now, you expect uh, significant savings, but let's go to the bottom here. Finances aside, right? We don't want to think just about finances. This isn't just money that we're talking about. We want to have the patients and their family caregivers optimize the highest possible state of health and quality of, of life. So also living independently in communities. That's what we've talked about in nursing from the beginning. From nursing school day one, right? We want to get people the highest quality of life, the best comfort that they can have, the best care, and to be able to live independently in communities. That's, that's what we want. Now how is it that we can fit that in with everything else that we're doing? Right? We've got the other priorities, the more acute situation. Well now, in order to reduce health care costs, there's actually financial incentives behind that. So there is a value that is put on that. And what that does is gets us to think about how is it that nurses have it built into the system that they can do the things that are the most important for nursing. And that's something that, again, each institution has to be able to work out in terms of how to balance all the things that are already on the plate of what's going. And that, I think, provides a number of opportunities for research in the clinical setting. How is it that we can take some of the activities that we're doing, right, that fill our time that are important and life-saving, but also have this transition built into the system? And how is it that we can make it a smooth continuum of care to be able to not only engage the patients, but to have the patients engage in themselves, right? What are the incentives that we can create that? So again, repeating what I just said, our goal is to have patients, family, caregivers optimized towards highest possible state of health, quality of life, while living independently in communities. So again, patient engagement, it's a growing body of evidence demonstrates patients who are more actively involved in their care experience better health outcomes. The more you're engaged, the better the outcomes are for you. So many public and private care organizations employing strategies to better engage patients, educating them about their conditions, involving them more fully in uh, the decisions about their care. So that assumes that everybody is equal in their ability to be engaged in their care, right? So I'm, what, what's the other thing we need to think about? We need to think about patient activation. And that is, what are the knowledge, skills, ability, willingness to manage his or her own health care? Right? We can't just assume that you talk to a patient and they're ready to go. So you have to think about where are they starting from. Patient engagement is the broader concept combining patient activation with interventions designed to increase activation, promote positive behavior, and, and uh, ultimately towards the triple aim, and that is improving health outcomes, better patient care, and lower costs. So there have been models that have been developed to be able to look at a framework of patient and family engagement in healthcare. And uh, again, the top one is direct care, then there's organizational design and governance, and policy making. When we think of direct care, consultation, patients receive information about a diagnosis, then involvement, patients are asked about their preferences in the treatment plan, and then partnership, again the treatment plan, again working together with the patient's preferences, medical evidence, and clinical judgment. Right? So there are some patients that will say, you know what? I've gotten to the point where I don't want this kind of treatment. For me, 
it's got more downside than upside. How is it that you involve the patient in the decision making? Shared decision making. So patients providers together consider the patient's condition, treatment options, medical evidence behind the treatment options, benefits, risks of treatment, right? Each of these elements. And again, there are some preference sensitive conditions, treatment options, that is, patients themselves, when given the choice, may or may not choose particular treatments or to be treated at all. Shared decision making, what's some of the research on that? Uh, Lagar and Wittemann in Quebec noted shared decision making has to have several essential elements. First, providers and patients must recognize that a decision is required, right? You have to come to terms with that. Then they must have at their disposal and understand what's the best available evidence. Then they must incorporate the patient's preferences. Now how is it that you incorporate the patient's preferences? That means the patient has to understand. That means they have to be activated. And that's one of the things that we have to work on. There's another clinical trial that was done. It looked at six different uh, preference sensitive conditions and they used different decision making support, right? So they had health coaches for all the patients. And one group of health coaches uh, talked over the phone, by mail, by internet, to be able to get information back and forth with uh, the patients. And again, the coaches um, uh, encouraged communication, but what was the impact, right, going through all this effort? Well, what it showed is that when you have the enhanced decision-making support, right, the phone, the internet, individualizing, that medical costs were reduced for those compared to those uh, just getting the usual support, and there were 12% fewer admissions to the hospital, there were 21% fewer preference sensitive heart surgeries. So, again, the shared decision making you know, it didn't cut things in half, you don't want them to cut them in half. You know, you want people to be able to make decisions, and having that decision support where you're talking with the patients, coaching them through having the education, providing information in a number of different ways can make a difference in terms of, uh, of engagement. Patients who are activated have the skills, ability, willingness to manage their own health care, experience better health outcomes. Remember we said that before. So Hibbard uh, put together a patient activation measure, a survey that scores the degree to which someone sees themselves as a manager of their own health care, right? And uh, this is a slide that shows the predicted per capita cost of patients by activation level. Level one is the lowest level of activation, level four the highest. If we look at the predicted bill costs that go with that, $966 for the lowest activated highest 799, right? So 20% increased cost with the lowest level of activation. So that's an important thing. What is it that a patient knows? What is it that their attitude, what is it in terms of their sense of self-efficacy? And that's an area that we want to develop. How can we help to activate in terms of knowledge, in terms of attitudes, Again, that's working with the patients one-on-one -on -one as a group. There's other types of patient engagement. We've talked about one-on-one, -on -one, right? Making decisions about your care, being able to take the next steps. But there's also outside the hospital some consumer-based uh, projects, the conversation project. Again, grassroots public campaign. It's getting people to think about how they want to spend their last days and having open and honest discussions with their families. Again, before a crisis occurs, patients can consider clearly communicate their wishes. There are a number of other projects that are like this. It's getting engaged in care, but also being able to disengage, having those kinds of discussions ahead of time. 
What are the barriers to activation and engagement? There are some factors involving patients, and there are other ones involving the providers. Barriers uh, involving the patients, number one, health literacy. Right? What's uh, one way to work with health literacy issues? Teach back. How many people are familiar with teach back? I would imagine quite a bit, right? And that is not just telling a person, but having them tell it to you back and to be able to have that back and forth so it's a conversation. Right? Teach back has been shown to be helpful, good research behind that. What are some of the most effective methods in doing that? Diversity background, again, degree of engagement may differ for different cultural groups by gender. Right? Women more likely to engage than men. Uh, we've known this for years in almost every single study, and uh, that's why us guys uh, like to have you around. <laughs> it, yeah. Cognitive issues, what's your choice architecture? Again, what are the ways people make choices? They tend to be established. Can you work at uh, Teach Back to work around those kinds of choices? And you can't talk to patients about considering cost. Say, first of all, cost is not something that gets put on the table. But if we're talking about how is it we can keep insurance down and you know save money, that's really more of a concern for us as providers or as hospital administrators than it is for the patients. So you know, patients are interested in what's the best care that you can get, what's quality. Uh, maybe they're inexperienced about what those kinds of issues are, and certainly self-interest. I want the best. Yes, I know health care is expensive, and so we should do something about it, but uh, I want the best. What are factors involving providers? And this one is there are a number of things. One is time constraints. We just heard this before. And that is, uh, I don't have enough time to build this into what I'm doing. I've got all these different things that I've got to get done. And there were 38 studies that were reviewed. And what it showed is that, in fact, there was no evidence of time constraint. There were opportunities in the time frames that were available uh, throughout the experience where those kinds of interventions could take place. Insufficient provider training, right? In other words, you don't just hand out brochures. You got to get people to understand what's in there. Lack of incentives, information system shortcomings to track providers, right? So again, it, are are you getting a flag saying make sure you talk with the person about this? So there was a study in Northern California. I won't tell you where. And they had a large supply of material, but they didn't distribute the brochures even after training. So, so much for uh, getting people activated and engaged. What are the policy implications? Affordable Care Act, that's been a big driver on this thing. Section uh, 305, you know, there are a bunch of sections here that talk about shared decision making, resource center. Again, funding to stimulate research in that area. Uh, Section 3021, uh, again, Center for Medicare, Medicaid Innovation. There are a number of uh, projects that are saying, what are some of the creative ways we can tackle some of these problems? Right, we've talked about them here. They're words at kind of a high level, but how is it that we translate that to the bedside and to the clinics? Uh, there's the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, or PCORI, and that is really a phenomenal uh, institute to be able to bring together uh, requests for funding, opportunities to take some of the questions that we're talking about right now and lay out a study design and work together. These do not have to be multi-centered, you know, highly complex kinds of designs. But what are the centers, institutes that we can put together uh, to be able to do that? Uh, that's at the federal level, right? Incentives being put in, resources being put in to improve engagement. It's also been happening at the state level. Washington, Massachusetts, they're funding projects on 
shared decision making. Packard Hospital, I went to the website, and uh, you empower families, right? So there's a center that's been able to look at this. It's the Partnership Empowering Parents and Professionals, the PEP, if I am uh, saying that correctly. Again, believe that families and professionals together can have a true partnership where the expertise and opinions of each are important when making decisions about the health care of children. You got it happening right here, right? Aspects of family-centered care most valued by parents, parent-professional partnerships, parental decision-making that is informed, access to critical information. Uh, these have not been key elements of health care in the traditional medical model, but this project that's here seeks to instill these practices into the current health care system. You're doing it. How many of you knew that? Everybody? Well, it's there. Look it up. We got a faculty member I'm just going to mention uh, uh, briefly, Audrey Linden, who's at the school, and she's an associate professor now. And she's looked at a number of research questions using qualitative methods. She's looked at frontline provider perspectives on safety challenges and the likelihood of speaking up about concerns. The, uh, you know, if you commit an error, how likely is it that you can bring that up and into uh, people's attention? How can you increase resilience in healthcare workers to promote recovery from error? Quality improvement in maternal neonatal care. And again, uh, the California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative, which is here at Stanford. She's been looking at maternal morbidity during childbirth hospitalization. Uh, parent engagement and safety and quality. How do parents think about safety in the NICU and their knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs? And one of the things that she looked at was separating out uh, physical safety from developmental safety and watching over my baby in terms of emotional safety. And one of the things that she saw is that parents were uh, fine with the physical safety, trusting of the nurses, of the environment, but where there were concerns was developmental safety. How is this experience of being in the NICU going to have a long-term impact uh, on the children, right? Mm -hmm. So what is that experience and wanting to become engaged on that? So she's got a number of interventions uh, that she's looking at to test, increase early parental involvement in feeding and comfort, integrate advanced clinician communication training, and uh, formally involve parents in identifying hazards, inconsistencies, opportunities for improvement. So again, it's that patient engagement that we were talking about before. Now, what factors have the greatest impact on creating health work cultures that promote safety and quality? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Staff nurse leadership. Staff nurse leadership. Patient engagement. Patient engagement. The culture of safety. Culture of safety. What we're going to do is call it organizational climate. Organizational climate. And what that means is the leadership of the staff nurses on the ward. It's not just top hospital administration. You know, the fellow that took over at Alcoa a number of years ago, they said, what's your vision for Alcoa going into the next decade? He said, safety, right? And any time the conversation came up, it was safety. That was the most important thing. And what happened is productivity increased, profits increased. Why? Because that was care and concern about the workers, the environment, reducing those times where things were down, right? So that's a productivity model. There are a number of areas where we've looked at uh, uh, the organizational climate. It has to come from the top, from the bottom, all together, right? If you're going to have work cultures that promote safety and quality, that's where we are. So I've talked about patient